So hi, uh, this is Joe Maycook uh, here with the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society in the PHS office building at 100 North 20th Street. Um, today's date is April 20th, 2022. Actually. And so today I am here with Ellen Wheeler, um, who has worked at PHS for over 40 years, I believe. Is that right? That's correct. Yes. Um, and currently work um, you're the preview party manager? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so I want to ask more about um, that, obviously, because uh, we're interested in capturing the history of preview parties and your long and storied career. But uh, I'd like to start off with a question about your personal background, if that's all right, and how you can then lead into that. Sure. Well, yeah. I um, don't come from this neck of the woods originally. My husband does. And my mother-in-law was a PHS volunteer and, in fact, was the first coordinator for the program we called, um, not City Harvest, sorry. Um, Philadelphia Green? Uh, no, no, no. It was a, a contest that we, the City Gardens contest, that's what it was, that started back in probably 1979. And my mother in law was also very um, experienced in nomenclature and would help type up all the cards for the flower show. And when we got married and were living in Washington, she thought, you know, you really need to come up here, you need to work for PHS. And lo and behold, position um, being Ernesto Ballard's assistant opened up in October of 1979. <laughs> We've been here ever since. Wow, okay. Um, that's good, because I wanted to, I want to ask specifically about um, Ernesto Ballard um, as well. And you gave kind of the transition from Washington, D.C. to Philadelphia very nicely there. I want to go back even further though to start. Um, where did you grow up? And um, did you or your neighbors have gardens there? Yeah. I'm a Virginian. Um, and even though my husband likes to point out that I've been here longer than I live there, I still consider myself a Virginian. And, um, you know, always enjoyed having a little spring garden with my mother and growing sweet peas and irises and things like that. Um, you know, we're lucky in this part of America that we have four seasons and we can enjoy everything that that brings, except for the pollen from the oak trees. But <laughs> the bane of my so, existence. Someone's got a vendetta. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> right. Um, so your first memories of gardening then would, would be with your mother. Yep. Um, was she the one who taught you how to garden? Well, she always gave me a space and I could see um, and appreciate the things that she grew. Um, she could. She was a great rose grower. I've never been able to do that. Don't have enough sun to do it. And she just had a touch with certain things. And um, you know, when you, you know, my my mother was born in 1913. So a lot of history of anybody is that you would probably have a garden if you had any if you had any relatives who lived in the country. You grew and you canned your own stuff. Um, that really wasn't too much a part of um, my heritage, but you know that's how we get to where we appreciate what comes from the earth. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then um, you meet your husband. You live in Washington D.C. and then you and then from your husband's mother, well, from your mother-in-law, yep. your husband's mother, you come to learn there, there's this position at PHS available with Ernesto Ballard. Um, and so you come to PHS in 1979. Um, do you remember your first meeting um, with Ernesto? Well, sure. I mean, I remember the interview. I was in New York um, at a trade show with my old job and call came, Ernesto wants to interview you. Um, she was a remarkable person. Um, you think back about a woman achieving uh, what she did in those times. Philadelphia is a very traditional city. All leadership positions, whether in business or nonprofit, were all male. Mm -hmm. And Ernesta um, 
a quiet determination, amazing knowledge, um, and she really started, I think, um, a whole, opened up a whole avenue for many, many women. Um, she brought PHS from where it was to the success of the flower show, and then Jane Pepper really, with her at the helm, it really blew up after that. I mean, when uh, we started, there were 25 of us um, when I first started here at PHS. And now we have 100 or so people who work on various programs or, you know, endeavors that we have. So it was very remarkable. Um, Ernesto was not loud, but you knew what she expected of you, which was um, to always be there and do your job. Do you have any anecdotes um, from those couple years as her assistant? <laughs> um, I mean, not sort of funny ones. We used to have a little saying that we always <laughs> knew that um, the only excuse for not being at work was if we were dead. <laughs> <laughs> she she was kind of a walk softly, but you knew where you stood with her. Um, but I remember she retired, I'm pretty sure, at the end of 1980. And I, and I was at the office that day on a New Year's Eve. Jane Pepper was there. And at some point, Ernesta just said, well, there's nothing else for me to do here. And we helped her carry her stuff down to her car. You know, just sort of a quiet exit. Um, but she was a real trailblazer for women in the Philadelphia area. Yeah. I mean, you, you noted that, like, when you came, there were 25 staff. Um, when Ernesta came, I believe it was a lot less than that. Oh, I'm like, sure. Like, well, I'm non-existent. Sure. Probably volunteer. 10 people. Yeah. When she um, first started, it was, you know, uh, I mean, the, they took over, the PHS took over the flower show, I think it was in 1966, something like that. And so it was just a handful of people. Yeah. Um, yeah, we have a history of it um, by Ted Moss. I don't know if you've read it, but yeah. So, just a quick shout out to that. Um, so, Ernesta retires. You were her assistant at the time of her retiring, right? So where did you go from there in the organization? Well, I then supported Jane and you know, there were so few of us, you know, so, so much of what we do now is siloed. We have a job. Um, back then, we all were hands-on. I mean, you know, not only was there the preview party, there was something called the Exhibitors Awards Luncheon. I handled the insurance for the organization, the pension fund, which was silly. Um, we had one accountant. Um, it, it was quite varied. Um, a lot of the shows and um judges and awards, I worked on that. Um, so you got a big picture of everything going on, and when we would have members' evenings, everyone had to be there to help either serve or clean up. I mean, that's just how we were. It was a real family. Um, and we got to know so many of the, you know, the people in the gardening community who, not only did we have an impact on them, but they had a huge impact on us. And we did some great programs. So anyway, I worked for Jane full-time until um, 83 when we started having children. She very nicely um, offered me um, the position to keep doing the preview party. And I'm like the bad penny that keeps showing up. <laughs> and um, we used to have another fundraising event called the Azalea Garden Party. Um, and I worked on that for a number of years until it disappeared. The Azalea Garden, referring to the one in Fairmount Park? Yes. We restored that in the, I want to say, either late 80s or early 90s. Um, it had been there. We had done it originally back in the 50s. Then we came up with a restoration plan and fundraising. And so we would have a party every spring during Azalea time. Couldn't guarantee they would be in bloom. Um, as a way to keep people's attention on it and it is a very loved as you know park here in town yes i know <laughs> i yeah i like it um so in 1983 you kind of transitioned from the general all-purpose role into that you had been doing into focusing specifically on the preview party and the azalea right. party right yeah um and so um, what was your first preview party like? My first preview party was 1980 in Lyndon Pennock, who 
I'm sure you've probably interviewed people about Meadowbrook Farm, was um, the chair of the party. Um, it was a little overwhelming at first. I've never had to coordinate a dinner where there were 1,400 people <laughs> and make sure they all got to their places. Um, but we had such a great um, committee that helped make sure everything would run smoothly. Um, you know, and the and committee has cha- committees have changed over the years. Um, when Ernesta first started the party in 1966, and the council thought, why would anyone want to come to that? I think we had, because I did a little history a number of years ago, mm-hmm. um, I think they had 400 people there. Because the flower show is a celebration of, look what we've done and put together. Mm-hmm. And because who Ernesta was, people wanted to support her. We had, back then, even, even then, great legion of volunteers. So yeah, in, in, for a, in for a nickel, in for a dime, whatever the expression is. Um, and if you were invited to become a member of the preview party committee, that was a really special invitation. You know, committee life has changed since then because there's so many, um, you know, so many younger people are work, both working, don't have time. The way you raise money through development is, a, is different than it was back Mm -hmm. in the 80s and 90s, there were far fewer nonprofit organizations. Mm -hmm. And so the big, the, you know, the big ones in Philadelphia, there was the Flower Show Preview Party, the Academy of Music Ball, Mm -hmm. which has, is now not taking place. There was the Zubilee um, and the Franklin Institute. All, they were the ones that people attended. Now, of course, there's a lot of demand for all those dollars. Yeah. Um, but um, I had the opportunity to work with some amazing, you know, denizens of society as far as Philadelphia was concerned. And that was, it was a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. <laughs> a lot of fun. Do you have any anecdotes from that period? Well, sure. I mean, we had um, two, <laughs> two of my favorite committee ladies, and I always had, we had a great system for when we had... Um, a lot of people coming for dinner. I mean, we had at one point 2,000 people for a seated dinner. It's a lot of place cards. And we would double check, double check, double check. We spent two weeks doing all this because things change. Mm-hmm. And one of my volunteers dropped them. And I just walked away and I said, sorry, you dropped them. You have to pick them up. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> or the year that Ernesta retired, we had a big going away party, or a big celebration at the convention center. And we thought, well, we'd have X number of people. And we ordered X number of plants because Lynn Pennock was heading up the committee. And the night before, we realized, hmm, we don't have enough primulas. So my husband and I get in the car on a snowy night and drive to Lancaster County to find primulas. Because <laughs> this was in February, something like that. It was yeah. very, very cold and snowy. Um, but there have been lots of fun stories along the way. Um, probably my most favorite thing that would, all, that would happen at the dinner. Rarely did we have a problem with people getting to the right table, even when we had over 200 tables in the ballroom. Mm-hmm. And it in, inevitably would be some gentleman sitting at the table, and I'd go over and say, oh, I think there might be a little mistake here. Nope. And I said, well, may I see your place card? And they would pull a place card out from their dinner jacket that was from another event. <laughs> oh, my god! Which meant that they hadn't had their tuxedo clean <laughs> since... <laughs> since the last go around so that that would be our handful of mistakes that ever happened with seating <laughs> wow um wow uh do you have any more anecdotes from working at phs at that time with that like staff of 25 or so do you want to share None that really come up to mind. I mean, I, I'm sure that I have a lot packed away, but nothing that really just springs forward. Well, I guess one that did come to mind as you were just saying that is you mentioned Jane Pepper, and I, yeah, my, I know a lot more about Ernesta Ballard than I do about Jane Pepper. <laughs> well, <laughs> there's a wealth of information about Jane Pepper. Jane, her energy, her... her push up your sleeves kind of attitude and getting things done so respected in this town 
Um, mm -hmm. And during the course of the 80s and 90s, who attended the preview party changed a bit. It used to be just sort of the, what I call the Fowler Show family, um, celebrating what they'd done and, and wanting to support a bit, an event. Mm -hmm. And then we started getting a lot of corporate um, uh, support. And some people frowned on that, saying, well, who are these companies? Well, these companies were, they were buying tables. These were the presidents of the companies. They weren't just buying it to send people. They were bringing their best customers or clients or colleagues to show what Philadelphia does really beautifully, and that's the Fowler Show. Um, and, for instance, Aramark. I think one time they bought 16 tables, brought all their lines of business, brought people from all over the country to showcase what they could do in seating and in, in serving 2,000 people at a seated dinner. Um, we would have banks take whole separate rooms of 100 of their best customers. So we weren't worried about that. It was great support. That's changed since tax laws have changed the way companies spend money. I mean, people say, oh, you supported the preview party. Isn't exactly the uh, way they want to be seen, even though they're supporting our programs. Mm -hmm. We still have a lot of those companies with us, but they will support a program specifically. They won't attend the party. So we still have a lot of those same people, but also a lot of companies are no longer um, headquartered in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. and um, particularly the banking industry, that kind of thing. So we've lost a lot of that support. Um, but Jane was so admired by everyone. And I, and I, you know, that push up your sleeves kind of thing. I mean, to see her out visiting people from everywhere in Philadelphia, and I think that's one of the hallmark of gardeners, and you probably as a, an appreciator of gardening see this. It's a sharing community. Let me show you how I grew this tomato and let me give some to you or let me give you some seeds for this. I love that about PHS much more than other organizations who don't have that kind of sharing mentality. I mean, what a great umbrella that brings us. We're all just people getting their hands dirty mm -hmm. and have an appreciation for that. Um, and <laughs> I remember... Here's a little anecdote. We had something called the Harvest Show, and, we, and mm -hmm. at one point we had it at Memorial Hall, and Jane and I agreed that we would take entries in the evening for people who were bringing in their, their, you know, tomatoes and peppers and all kinds of things they were entering in the show. And we then realized that there was no sort of, there were no, like, lights. <laughs> there was no electricity. So we had a couple of, I think I found a couple of votive candles, and where they're taking in entries by candlelight. It was very exciting. <laughs> uh, that's very, I mean, that's, you know, uh, that's a very, that does kind of fit with the theme, though. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Arguably, uh, what, a, what a very festive fall time decoration candles. Right, right. Yeah. Um, wow. so, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I remember I see, if, like, looking up, the Jane Pepper, Jane Pe photos of Jane Pepper in the archives um, that we have digitized. Like, there's so many of her people all over the city um, oh. and whatnot. So, yep. that, that definitely And fits. she, she um, you know, still has an impact on us. Um, you know, her support and, you know, she's involved with natural lands, um, conservancy, um, you know, it's mostly up in Chester County and the great work that they do. She's yeah. she's remarkable. She is a remarkable person. Cool. Um, yeah, I like how you've drawn this link between them, as between Ernesta and Jane as well, and like explicitly kind of, you know, rendered the, I don't know, I want to say that like almost feminist, like historical trajectory going on in an organization that was once really um, historically dominated by men right. when like Ernest, I mean even when, well, when Ernesta came it came to it um, right well you've probably done some research on the organization Flower Show Incorporated Flower Show Inc which is who had the Flower Show prior to that mm -hmm. um, and in fact one of our um, 
one of the women who was on my committee, she was closing up vast estate and came across what we call schedules, which is the, that's the booklet that people get that have the list of classes that you can enter at the show. And this, during Flower Show Incorporated time, um, it was mostly for commercial growers. And I have a couple, I gave them to Janet, a couple of those um, um, catalogs or whatever that, that we had. Um, uh, so it was different. And, and one of the reasons it, and I'm sure it's in the Flower Show history book, one of the um, privileges of membership was that you got to go to the Flower Show. And when Flower Show Inc. said, well, we're not going to do it, Ernesta said, but we have to. It's a, mem- it's, a, it's a membership thing. And that's when the transition started. And they had the first Flower Show, I think, in the Armory over on 22nd Street. Wow. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you for all that history. I honestly don't know as much about, I didn't study the flower show specifically as much as PHS when I was researching it first. So thank you for that. Um, I guess I want to can make sure my years and information are correct. <laughs> I, I, I don't, I don't doubt it at all. I don't doubt it at Around all. Around that time. No, no, no. The ni- yeah. 1966 rings, um, you know, fits with everything that you, everything that I know. Um, and I, yeah, I only write down these notes because they help me remember these things and also ask you, potentially ask you more follow-up questions. Um, but I guess um, you mentioned changes from 1980s to 1990s, um, but throughout the next couple decades, um, how, and you mentioned also like, you know, kind of the proliferation of nonprofits, changes in tax laws. Mm-hmm. Um, how has that impacted, I guess, your roles and responsibilities in, I mean, your responsibilities in organizing um, the party? Well, it, at one time, like the Academy Ball, if you didn't return the invitation pretty quickly, you might not be able to attend. Now, it wasn't quite as hard to accommodate folks here as opposed to the Academy Ball, um, but we were a very hot ticket. Um, and even, th- is so interesting, our, the zenith was 2,000. We had 2,000 for a seated dinner, another 1,300 for cocktails. 3,300. 3,300 people. And... Um, even in 2001, people were determined, and it wasn't even 2001, it was 2002, after 9-11, people were still determined to come. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, uh, you know, with businesses um, impacted by that, as I said, headquarters for companies moving out of town, consolidation, we started seeing a little drifting of the numbers going down. Of course, 2008 and 2009 really impacted us. Um, mm-hmm. We had good attendance the year Jane retired, which I believe was 2010. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had you know, a lot of people wanted to attend that because why wouldn't you want to say goodbye? Mm-hmm. We had a transition to a different president. Um, and you know, there's a different way the next generation thinks about going to fundraising events. Sometimes it's not just about, oh, well, let's go to a party. There has to be meaning behind it. So we try very hard to message what it is that we do at PHS. We do so many things, that's a bit of the challenge. Mm-hmm. We do a lot. Yeah. Um, sometimes we have to get really specific so people understand it. You know, we have a huge audience of people who flower show. Other people are more interested in what we do in the city and how our programs can affect communities. Um, Then there was a decision to put the party on Friday nights. Um, You know, Saturday nights usually the night people go out and party, right? A big to-do. That has impacted us, but on the other hand, we can now offer two full weekends to the public for the show to be open. 
So our our night is now traditionally Friday night. It's a preview mm-hmm. party. Um, people don't l- like to wear as much formal wear anymore. I mean, mm-hmm. it was a big, you know, it's always been black tie, although the interpretation of black tie today is different than it was in 1980. Um, there's many interpretations of that I don't quite get the t- the black T-shirt with it, but somehow that's that's made its way in. <laughs> um, and and less formal wear for for ladies, of course. Um, and Friday nights not the night you sh- usually would get all dressed up like for a gala, mm-hmm. so that's changed. Um, and people are so busy they have a hard time committing until, as I like to say, 10 minutes before something happens. Let that be a lesson to you, young man. <laughs> oh, well, I can't believe I came to this interview and got roasted. That's right. <laughs> um, and there's so many options out there for, for our very busy lives. Mm-hmm. So all those things have impacted how we try to raise money for the organization, and the need is great. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. what we want to do is impactful, but we can only do it with as much as we can do when we get a lot of support. Mm-hmm. Okay, I want to move forward now that you've kind of brought us through like those historical changes to um, the present. So obviously the flower show is coming up pretty soon. Pretty soon. Yeah, <laughs> less than two months. Right. Um, so without spoiling anything, would you like, uh, what would you like to share about the preview party this year? Well, as you know, last year we were outdoors and we'll be outdoors again this year, which, you know, looking at doing things a totally different way to be safe last year, and we're continuing it. Instead of having, you know, tables for 10 or whatever, 12 people, we're, we're doing four tops, you know, to keep things um, just a little tighter. We just don't, we can't seat as many people for sure. Uh, people love the outdoor and, you know, provided we have good weather. Um, it will be another lovely evening. Um, people just really love coming to see the show. They love the show. Um, and it usually just takes one visit before they're hooked. That's the whole thing. People, oh, flower show, blah, blah, blah. That's what a bunch of flowers, right? And then they see what we do and enjoy the evening. So we're, weather permitting, we'll have fireworks. That was a surprise last year. Um, Mm-hmm. Um, I asked the fireworks person to please guarantee that we would have good weather. <laughs> Be prepared. Um, but I think people will, you know, it's so different. We have such a different audience flower show wise um, than we do for the indoor show. The indoor show I kind of mm-hmm. call, now that we've done it outside, the jewel and the crown. Because... Um, when you see what we do at the indoor show, it's amazing. We have a different group of exhibitors at the outdoor show because the people who traditionally exhibit inside are out working. The contractors, they're out there making their money in the summer. So that's opened up a whole new um, group of relationships for us with those new uh, exhibitors. Um, and we also we see more families, we see more diverse groups, um, and that's part of PHS's future. It can't just be people who look like me get on the train and go to the convention center. Um, you know, the, the, <laughs> the loyal, the loyalist, um, so to speak. So that's been great for us. Um, it's just, it was just wonderful sitting there looking at the show and see who came to visit us. It was great. It was great. That's really good. Um, and I want to ask a little. I want to ask a little more soon. But first, I just want to ask another plan. Another question about your present and future. Um, you mentioned that when you grew up, um, you know, you grew a lot of things with your mother, um, including roses. Um, you met, and you incidentally also mentioned that you haven't been growing roses yourself because I'm a shady gardener. Yeah, you're a shady gardener. So <laughs> yes. what? So what have you been growing, and do you have any plans for this growing season? Well, yes, as I looked out my office window at home (laughs) yesterday, there are some things that need to be transplanted. Um, I have to kind of divide it between the front yard and the backyard because the backyard is fenced in. We have a dog, so there are certain things I just 
kind of get over because I know he'll trample them. In the front yard, I have to be very specific against deer, of course, um, so I can grow all those hostas in the backyard. <laughs> um, you know, we're adding a new fire pit area this year. Um, always trying to find a few evergreens that will help us out. Um, hard to do in a partially shady area. Um, mm -hmm. There's some tree trimming. We need some pruning done. Um, but it's uh, in, in a, every year I have a tree peony. And it always puts out these really gaudy, huge blooms. And I think about the tree penny. It's been first base when your kids were playing baseball. Um, it has been transplanted about three times, and yet it comes back every year. Kind of like me, wow. just come back every year. Kind of, it's very rewarding. So I like to, I like to putter in the backyard for sure. That's nice. Um, I didn't, I didn't know peonies that they, the tree peonies existed. I just always know, only, I've only seen the small ones. Right, well they're woody um, oh. more than they are um, herbaceous. Um, so they don't disappear, you have you know old tangled wood and there are some amazing ones around. But it's a very, uh, the yellow ones are the most beautiful but these are huge fuchsia colored blossoms. And you've transplanted it three times. At least three times, it's just, and peonies don't like to be transplanted, <laughs> and yet the old girl keeps on coming back. <laughs> Always around Mother's Day, it keeps on coming back. Well, yeah. um, <laughs> that's a nice image. Uh, I guess I want to, at this point, um, you mentioned kind of, well, you, you already kind of got to this a little bit when you were talking about, you know, the preview party this year and how demographics have changed. But I guess I want to close it by asking, what are your... What do you see as kind of your future plans to work with PHS and your future, your dream future for the organization more broadly? Well, I think it's important to continue to support um, some of the programs that I think are so wonderful here that PHS mm -hmm. has come up with. Um, something that my husband and I um, have made a commitment to is the public landscapes, mm -hmm. which was a big thing that came along with Jane. Um, we used to call it Legacy Landscapes, and that's where you see Logan Square, mm -hmm. Logan Circle, whatever we had called, yeah. the Azalea Garden, some other places around. Because, you know, when you live in a beautiful city, um, it makes a difference. Um, you know, I might even be one of those volunteers. <laughs> I'm not sure I'll be helping Janet in the library, but maybe with, with signs at the show. Um, you know, it's been wonderful working here for these many years. Um, I definitely see my time. Let's just say I won't be here another 43 years. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Um, and, um, you know, I think PHS will continue um, to do well as long as it has strong leadership. And we hope to encourage other volunteers to come along because we need some new young volunteers like you, um, you know, because... We're all graying a bit. <laughs> oh, thank you very much, um, Ellen. I've learned a lot. Um, it's been an honor to ask you these questions and hear your recollections um, and your, you know, your visions, your thoughts, etc. Um, well, thank you, and I'm glad we had a chance to finally connect all this. Yes, I'm going to turn off the recording now.